crash course in pre-calc, here to summarize all of Murphy's third unit so you don't have to. I'm Haley Counts. And I'm Caroline Hendricks. And this is your crash course in pre-calculus. While 3.1 didn't have a video or a lesson to go along with it, the nine short homework problems were just as easy. Honestly, it just went over how to divide, how to draw squiggly lines, and how to plot basic points. And if you don't know how to do that, then I'm concerned. <laughs> So, for now, we are going to take 3.1 and throw it away. Ah. Haters would say it's fake. <laughs> At this point in time, most of us know what a sine wave looks like. In 3.2, however, Murphy decided to elaborate. By elaboration, we mean he gave us even more difficult equations and complicated information. The overall function equation is a sine b x minus c plus d, which shouldn't be new to you. a stands for amplitude, which will be measured by the distance between the mid-axis and the top of the arc here. It will always be positive because A measures a distance. So no matter if it is above or below the mid-axis or the x-axis, it will always be positive, making it absolute value of A at all times. C is going to define how far left or right the wave will shift, like so. But in fact, C is going to be opposite. If you have negative C, it is going to move to the right. And if you have positive C, it will move to the left. D, the other easy one, defines how far up the axis will shift. So say you have a regular sine wave here, where the axis is on the, the x-axis here. So this is the, ax the axis. D will, if you added 2, will define how far up the axis will move. So your axis will actually be now at 2, which is here. And instead, what will happen is you will move up 2. So it will be through the middle of your line right here, instead of at the top or even at the bottom. As of now, all we really know about the infamous B variable is that it can help us find the period of the sinusoid. First of all, it's important to note that B will always be positive. By following the formula 1 over B times 360, we can find the period of a sine or cosine wave. And that's all we know at the end of 3.2, which really is not a lot. Crash course in free calculus. I was like awkwardly biting my leg, like accidentally. And now it's time for supplementary videos with the one and only Nikki Brenneman. So here she is to give you the inside scoop on a probably unnecessary clip. Thanks for that flattering introduction, guys. For today's supplementary video, we're going to be talking about graphing reciprocals. First, let's make a table with columns for x, y, and the reciprocal 1 over x. We can use the line x equals y as an easy example. Wherever there is a 0, the reciprocal function will have an asymptote in the same place. For 1s, there will always be 1s. And for smaller fractions, there will always be bigger numbers. After you placed your basic points, you can connect the dots to make your line. This works with negatives, too, so don't forget to make the line on both sides of the asymptote. Assuming you can do that with lines and waves on your own time, that's all we have today for supplementary videos with Nikki. Back to you, Caroline! Okay. Thanks, Nikki. For most of Chapter 2, we learned about sine, cosine, and tangent. <laughs> and in 3.3, Murphy decided to review for 11 minutes. <laughs> 
Basically, we remembered that sine is y, cosine is x, and tangent is slope. However, Murphy did decide to teach us something new. What an asymptote is. An asymptote is everywhere the trig function is undefined. This example shows the asymptote of y equals tan x. Besides that, the only other important thing in 3.3 is the difference in periods of sine, cosine, and tangent. Sine and cosine have a period of 360 degrees, while tangent has a period of 180. This actually does make sense because for sine and cosine, the x and y coordinates, 1, 1, at for example, are never going to be the same as they are in the first quadrant until they've gone around 360 degrees. This being sine, this being cosine. So, obviously, to have a full period, you have to go around 360 degrees. However, for tangent, it's going to be different because tangent is the slope, meaning this would be tangent. Let's say we call this tan 1. If you go 180 degrees to about right here, tan 1 is going to be continued because it's a slope. Therefore, you only have to go 180 degrees to find the exact same slope. The same would be true for the other quadrants as well. Shocking, right? Calling 3.3 a small chapter would be a little bit of an understatement. That's really all we have for this one. Finally, too, because it's time for a break. What's she gonna do? Take whatever. I don't know what it is. Assuming you can do that with wines and lathes on your own time. What? Wines and lathes? Wait, what? Assuming you can do that with lines and waves on your Well, now when I say it, I'm laughing! Okay, sorry. Assuming you can do that with lines and waves on your own time. And now the moment you've all been waiting for. We are done with sinusoidal graphs. For now. In 3.4, we took a quick shift, beginning to learn about radians of a circle and how they are going to replace our degree system. Murphy started off with a lesson about pi, which is a ratio of circumference to diameter, but I, that's not really important. What is important, however, is what a radian is, which a radian is defined as how far the radius has gone around the outside of the circle. As Haley mentioned, the radian is defined by the simple equation arc length over radians. The arc length is the radian angle measurement, and radius is, well, radius. A full rotation can be labeled as 2 pi r, but if you were only going to go 180 degrees, it would be simply pi r. Now, if you need to convert from radians or degrees, you can use the equations I'm going to show you below. Pi over 180 times degrees will get you radians, but on the flip side, 180 over pi times radians will get you degrees. Radians are all about measuring angles based on arc lengths, not degrees. And while this chapter may seem short, it actually will be helpful in the future, which is a first. One of my favorite games as a kid was Fruit Ninja. I could sit there for hours slicing fruit. And while slicing circle graphs may bear many similarities to the iOS game, I don't think I could sit there for hours finding values on it. Basically, when Murphy says slicing, he means drawing a line through the circle and finding the points of intersection. So fun. By saying sine x equals 1 over 2, we're asking the question, where on the circle does y equal 0.5? Because, as we already know, sine is y. To answer this question, we first draw a line through 0.5 on the y-axis. Then we connect this line to the origin, creating a reference angle. If you know your unit circle points, you would know that the point is square root 3 over 2, comma 1 over 2, which makes a 30 degree angle. Since we know that 180 degrees is the same as pi, and 30 degrees is a sixth of that, the definition of this angle is pi over 6 plus 2 pi k. 
The 2 pi k is just used to show that the radian will repeat itself in 360 degrees. Another way you could describe this radian is from the second quadrant, which would be 5 pi over 6. You would do the same thing with cosine, but tangent is a bit different. While with cosine and sine, you ask what the x or y value is on a certain line, with tangent, you are asking when the slope is a certain number. If I were to say tan x equals negative 1, you would plot the slope of negative 1, and then find the points where it intersects. And since tangent repeats itself every 180 degrees and not 360 degrees, you would add pi k instead of 2 pi k. Your final radian measure would be 3 pi over 4 plus pi k, because you are making a 45 degree angle, which is a fourth of 180. We just threw a lot at you, but we're hoping you can slice on through it just like the everyday fruit ninja would. But don't worry, after you know this stuff, the rest of unit three is review. After a long journey together, we finally made it. So our last segment, and Haley, gotta say I'm relieved. Me too, Caroline, but before we continue on, Let's take a quick trip down memory lane, shall we? Savage. YouTube channel. However, we have one last problem we're going to cover from 3.6. Using this long equation here, the question we're trying to answer is, where on the circle is my x value 5? Using this as our guide, our first instinct should be to solve for x. To do this, you just follow order of operations to get x by itself. By doing this, we will be able to find the exact radian value without decimals or rounding. The last thing we have to do is find the period, which can be found here as 2 pi over 13. Since we know that to find a period in degrees, we divide 360 by the given value. In this case, you just have to divide the given value by 2 pi, the equivalent of an entire rotation. Therefore, your period is 13. And that's it, folks! The end of Unit 3. If you understood all the material we just threw at you, give yourself a pat on the back. And if not, well, you should probably go back and watch all of Murphy's videos. And if you still don't get it, go over his 3.7 word problems. They'll probably help. But for now, we are signing off. I'm Caroline Hendricks. And I'm Haley Counts. Vicky Brenneman. Who, who is that? <laughs> Supplementary video girl. Oh, she's not important. I forgot about her. Anyway, this has been your Crash Course in Pre-Calculus. All the chapters covered here directly correlate with the Forrester textbook and videos of Mr. Murphy. For more in-depth math instruction, visit Mr. Murphy's YouTube channel at Robert Marshall Murphy. Thanks for watching!